Hello and welcome to the podcast Buffy and the Art of Story Season 5. Today I'm talking about Episode 16, The Body, where everyone faces Joyce's death. If you love Buffy the Vampire Slayer and you love creating stories or just taking them apart to see how they work, you're in the right place. Along with the breakdown of the body, I'll talk about the group as the protagonist and death as the antagonist, storytelling through physicality, sounds, and lighting, Act breaks that center around how different characters deal with Joyce's death. Whether this atypical Buffy the Vampire Slayer episode lacks metaphor or is entirely metaphor, and how and why the body changes on rewatching. I am Lisa M. Lilly, mystery and thriller novelist, story expert, and founder of writingasasecondcareer.com, where you can learn more about fiction writing, publishing, and book marketing. There will be no spoilers for the body except at the end when I talk about foreshadowing, but I'll give you plenty of warning. Okay, let's dive into the hellmouth. The body's original air date was February 27, 2001. It was written and directed by Joss Whedon, and the DVD edition has commentary by Whedon, and I'll be including highlights from that throughout this episode. The body starts by repeating the last scene of the previous episode, I Was Made to Love You. It's a sunny afternoon. Buffy returns home and finds a bouquet of flowers and a card from the man Joyce went on a date with in that episode. She calls upstairs to Flower Getting Lady asking if Joyce wants her to pick up Dawn from school. In the background, we see Joyce motionless on her back on the couch in an awkward position, but Buffy doesn't notice her until she turns, and then she says, Mom, what are you doing? Mom, Mom, Mommy? This is the opening conflict, that conflict that draws the audience in but isn't always related to the main plot though here it definitely is and we go to credits at 0.45 seconds in the dvd commentary joss whedon said they never repeated an entire scene before but he felt it was worth repeating he also noted that last line of buffy's was written deliberately to take her from mom mom to mommy as she descends into a small girl who is losing her mother and whedon talked about that his goal was not to show some sort of meaning or catharsis or beauty of life that comes out of death. And he felt that TV often did this TV movies, stories associated these things with loss or even extreme grief. Instead, he wanted to be very specific about what it feels like the moment you learn you lost someone, including the extreme physicality of those first few hours and the almost boredom associated with all the things that need to be done. And that's why there's no music and there are scenes that take up entire acts almost. And it's meant to put the audience in that moment and create that airlessness and feeling of dumbfounded shock when you lose someone. We return from credits at 1 minute 40 seconds in, and we are at a holiday scene. Everyone's gathered around the table, and there are twinkling lights. I was so confused the first time that I saw this episode. I thought the narrative was jumping ahead to a future holiday and we were going to get some kind of reference about remember that terrible time. Looking at it later, that doesn't make any sense. And I think that part of me was in denial. I did not want to believe what I had just seen. I also thought maybe Buffy was imagining this, as she'll do later in the episode, but it went on so long that that didn't feel right either. And while 
I understand why the story is told this way now, and it worked for me on rewatching. There is a saying in advertising, the confused mind says no. So I do have a little bit of a question on how well this works if most people were confused. On the other hand, it may have been just me. So I'm curious if you want to weigh in on that. I'd love to hear. Joyce gets up to go get the pie and Xander says he feels like barfing and then rushes to clarify that he meant because it was all so good and he ate too much. Joyce accepts the compliment and disappears into the kitchen. Xander asks Willow if she's in the vomit club too And she does look a bit glassy-eyed. She says she had too much nog. Tara asks Willow if she wants her to rub her tummy and says to the others, she likes it when I stop explaining things. Tara and Xander ask if Dawn sent a letter to Santa and Dawn reminds them that she's 14. Anya says it's a myth. That is, it's a myth that Santa Claus is a myth. And now we get some minor conflict as Anya explains that Santa has been around since the 1500s. He wasn't always called Santa, but the flying reindeer and coming down the chimney are all true. And Dawn smiles and says, all true? And Anya responds with one of my favorite Anya lines, well, he doesn't traditionally bring presents so much as, you know, disembowel children. But otherwise, and Tara says, the reindeer part was nice. On the DVD, Joss Whedon said he wanted this holiday scene to show happier times, but that he made a mistake by having Joyce in the kitchen for much of it, and that he should have had Joyce coming back and taking the dishes, so she was always a constant presence in all their lives. And I love that comment because it shows how important simple um, physical presence and movement is in storytelling and will be throughout this episode. He also said he couldn't bear the credits being shown over Joyce's body, so he wrote this scene to be the exact length of the credits. Buffy goes into the kitchen where Joyce and Giles are. Joyce takes out the pie, which is burnt, but Buffy reassures her it's just blackened. It's Cajun pie. Giles suggests opening another bottle of wine. Joy says, do you think we dare? And Buffy says, as long as you two stay away from the band candy, I'm cool with anything. Giles clears his throat. Joy says, you are a demon child. And Buffy responds, I live to torment you. Is that so wrong? They hug. Buffy and Joyce share a nice moment. And I love the callback to band candy and this moment between Joyce and Giles. At 3 minutes 27 seconds in, Buffy says all they need to do is cut off the burnt part of the pie, but she starts to do it and the pie drops onto the floor and the scene cuts to Joyce, who is chalk white. Buffy runs to her saying, mom, 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 and then yelling, mom. She calls 911, tells the operator her mother's not breathing, not conscious. The operator asks if she knows CPR, and Buffy says, no. Oh, I don't remember. The operator gives her instructions and it starts coming back to Buffy. She says, I can do this. And she begins breathing into her mother's mouth. I love this way of showing the depth of Buffy's distress because Buffy doesn't panic when she faces vampires or demons or the apocalypse or multiple apocalypses, but here she panics and she forgets that she knows how to do CPR. She hears a crack when she does the compressions and at five minutes, eight seconds in, tells the operator about it and the operator asks if her mother is breathing. On the DVD, Joss Whedon said the rib cracking is almost an obscene physicality, much more than we usually want or are used to in Buffy, because death is physical, and in addition to that grief and loss, there is a body that those who are left must deal with. Around here in the episode is where I look for the story spark or inciting incident. It usually comes around 10% through or sooner, and it's the event that gets the main plot rolling. 
thing. Now, here we could see it as simply Buffy finding Joyce's body, but given Whedon's comment on the DVD, I see it as this moment of the rib cracking. This is the beginning of what he says is key to the episode, the dealing with the body, the physical aspects of death, and that is that first moment of extreme physicality for Buffy. The operator tells her the crack doesn't matter, the paramedics will be there soon, and Buffy says she's cold. And the operator says the body is cold, and Buffy responds, no, my mom, should I make her warm? The operator tells her to wait for the paramedics, they're very near. We can tell Buffy is gradually starting to take this in because While she says, no, my mom, when the operator says the body, she now tells the operator she has to make a call and hangs up. And the camera shifts to a close-up of the phone buttons. And this scene was all one long take until the phone buttons. And on the DVD, Whedon said he had it with a cameraman with the camera on his shoulder, no steady cam, because he wanted that feel of the handheld camera and the urgency of the moment. And he also talked about how extraordinary Sarah Michelle Geller was because she had to do this entire scene about seven times and run through all those emotions. And he pointed out that all the scenes in the house, even in a moment when Buffy will look outside, we don't see the street or the yard. We only hear the noises of what's happening outside. And it is showing Buffy closed in that space. Now she says into the phone, Giles, you have to come. And Giles says, Buffy. And Buffy says she's at the house. At 6 minutes, 42 seconds in, the paramedics arrive. And we know that because we hear the sirens getting closer and then sirens and engines shutting off as Buffy looks out. So again, not seeing what she's seeing. She pulls down Joyce's skirt before the paramedics enter and clutches the phone as they move Joyce onto the floor and start working on her. When they ask what happened and about her health history, Buffy says there was a tumor, quote, but she had an operation and she's fine now. She's been fine, end quote. At 7 minutes 58 seconds in, Joyce coughs and then breathes and Buffy rushes to kneel next to her saying, I'm here. And again, I was confused, which I do think was purposeful. I think for that second, we're supposed to believe they brought Joyce back despite how long we have seen her motionless and chalk white. And then there's a quick scene to the ambulance, Buffy inside it, a paramedic saying it's a miracle, a beautiful miracle, and Buffy is holding her mom's hand, and then a quick shift to Joyce in a hospital bed, and the surgeon at her side saying she's good as new, and Buffy and Joyce looking thrilled. So on first watch, I think I was still very much in denial because I so wanted this to be true and was thrown off by this. On rewatch, I completely got it. And Joss Whedon commented that he didn't know anyone who suffered the panic of a great loss who didn't imagine it coming out differently a thousand times or more. I identify with this. My parents, some of you know, were run over by a drunk driver and uh, my mom died at the scene my dad lived about six and a half weeks went through multiple surgeries and I would think over and over and over again about the moment it happened I was not there and I I don't know that I was trying to make it come out differently but I I think part of me was I would think well what if I had gone to their house beforehand they would have been delayed just a minute or two crossing the street and that driver would have been past the place that they were hit and so this scene with Buffy uh, hits me so much harder now when I rewatch. Everything is silent again in the living room. The paramedics are still working on Joyce and one says to the other, she's cold, man, and tells him to call it. The paramedic's face blurs when he tells Buffy he's sorry and comes into focus briefly as he talks, but the camera then shifts so we see first only the lower half of his face and then his chest. As he tells Buffy, it looks like... Her mother died a good while before Buffy found her. There was nothing Buffy could have done and that it was probably a complication from surgery and the coroner's office will come to take her. And this was deliberate, this 
angle on the paramedic, uh, Joss Whedon pointed out that it is all about Buffy and her mom, and their faces are blurred or we don't see the faces because she can't really relate to them as people. Also, and I didn't notice this till he pointed it out, but I'm sure it had an effect. There are moments when the paramedic's talking when we see from behind him and his shoulder takes up almost all of the frame and Buffy is there squeezed into a corner of the screen showing that she has nowhere to maneuver around this. When the paramedics leave, they tell her, try not to disturb the body. One says he's sorry for her loss, and Buffy wishes them good luck as they go outside to head to their next call. The ambulance sounds filter into the house, starting pulling away and a faint siren, and Buffy inside vomits on the rug. As wind chimes sway and chime, and the entire house is so brightly lit, there's so much sunshine, there's almost an orange cast to the light. Buffy goes to the back door, looks out. Again, we don't see the yard, and the camera closes up on her face, which is sweaty, and there are faint sounds of kids' voices and someone practicing the trumpet as life goes on, but Buffy is so removed from it. Inside, she puts a paper towel over the spot where she vomited. Giles enters as Buffy watches that towel soak up the vomit. And at 12 minutes, one second in, he says, Buffy, what is it? Is it glory? And Buffy turns to face him and in a stunned voice says she has to tell Dawn who's at school. And that's when Giles sees Joyce and he rushes to her. At 12 minutes, 26 seconds, Buffy says, no, no, don't. No, no, it's too late. They're coming for her. Giles kneels by Joyce calling her name and Buffy continues, no, no, we're, we're not supposed to move the body. And she puts her hand to her mouth at calling her mother the body. Giles goes to her and hugs her and the scene cuts to a commercial. We are more than a quarter way through the episode. Usually somewhere around here, we have what I think of as the one quarter turn. It's the first major plot turn that spins the story in a new direction and sometimes raises the stakes. If that were the structure used, you could see it as the paramedic telling Buffy her mother is dead. It's the first time someone says those words to her. But this moment when she says the body feels so much more striking because Buffy has gradually been taking in that her mother is dead, though she can't fully accept it. But now she says the body. Also, this is the act break in the script because Joss Whedon on the commentary said that he started every act with Joyce. And when we get back from commercial, we see Joyce's body as someone zips a body bag up until it covers her completely. So that's the start of the next act act and he said that some people accused him of being morbid because he showed Joyce so many times but it was for that reason to fit with the story of dealing with the body. At 12 minutes 56 seconds in Dawn cries in the girl's restroom and says I can't believe it and her friend says it's not that bad and Dawn responds how can you say it's not that bad so this is a misdirect because as they keep talking we learn this is all about teen drama not about Joyce Dawn does not know yet someone named Kirsty told everyone that Dawn cut herself a reference to blood ties and that Dawn's adopted and a guy named Kevin who Don likes called Don a freak and Don's friend says he didn't say freak he said freaky which can be cool but Don is not comforted and Joss Whedon said this act was the biggest risk he took because most of the act is not about Joyce. It is about this high school short story slash romance from a teen's point of view and the risk is the audience doesn't care about the teen drama because there is a dead person in the narrative. But his aim was to get at the complete ridiculousness of teen drama when juxtaposed with the death but also the importance of it how important it is to dawn and later 
after the act will be come about Buffy telling Dawn and it's the first time that someone has to be told Buffy found Joyce's body Giles saw Joyce this is the first time someone has to be told about Joyce's death and Joss Whedon wanted to spend the entire act telling Dawn's life before he tore it down and the the other risk was that the audience might be bored but he really liked telling that story and I was never bored with this I feel like the tension is very high because of dramatic irony we as the audience know that Joyce is dead and we know what Dawn is going to find out and that keeps the scene feeling fast moving Dawn worries about looking like a cry face in front of Kirsty, and on the way out of the restroom, she and her friend walk past Kirsty, who asks how Dawn is in a fake sweet voice, and Dawn, sarcastic, says, good, thanks for asking. At 14 minutes 54 seconds in, Dawn is in art class. The students draw based on a small statue of a woman, and the teacher says draw the negative space around the object, which I found significant that negative space will be repeated a couple times, and I feel like it goes to that question of what is not Joyce, where did Joyce go, which will come up later. The cute boy, Kevin, next to Dawn starts a conversation with her, and Dawn's friend writes, he wants you on her drawing page and holds it up behind Kevin. After complimenting Dawn's drawing, Kevin says he heard she cut herself. Dawn starts to deny it, but Kevin says he's felt like that before. Things get so intense. And they talk about Kirsty and how superficial she is. The art room is an interior room with windows that look out into the hall. And as Dawn and Kevin talk, The audience can see Buffy in her red shirt that is so bright heading for the room, but Dawn's back is to her, and she doesn't see as Buffy comes into the room and then approaches her, though we see in Kevin's face that he sees Buffy and already is concerned, and Buffy says, I have to talk to you. I have a listener comment on blood ties. This is from Roberta Lip, who commented on the eavesdropping when Dawn is eavesdropping. And I had expressed some frustration with that dramatic device. And Roberta says, oh, and the whole business with the repeated eavesdropping on the show. Here's the thing about the eavesdrop. Nosy people do not leave halfway through the conversation they are eavesdropping on. That is part of why those scenes feel so embarrassingly cartoonish. This so puts the finger on my problem with the eavesdropping, which I did not even realize until Roberta said this. Yes, I buy eavesdropping, but it drives me crazy that both Buffy and Dawn a couple times walk away after hearing the worst possible thing And it felt manipulative and unreal to me, but I couldn't quite grasp why because certainly people do listen to conversations. They do hear things that hurt their feelings and maybe don't understand the context. But Roberta is absolutely right. You hear something like that, you don't walk away. If you're someone who wants to hear what people are saying and to listen in, and especially when the conversation is about you, you keep listening. So thank you so much, Roberta, for that. It it really clears that up for me. And I don't know as writers what you would do if you want the person to only hear that part of the conversation. But I but I wish they had done something different so that was more believable. If you would like to share your thoughts about Buffy the Vampire Slayer or the podcast. Connect with me on Twitter or Instagram at Lisa M. Lily, L-I-S-A, M as in Marie, L-I-L-L-Y, on the Buffy in the Art of Story Facebook page or on YouTube. Or I just set up an email, I should have done this before, where you can email me your thoughts 
to buffystorypod at gmail.com. I did this now because it occurred to me someone might want to share thoughts that are more personal and not put them on the internet. So if you do email me, I will read it. I will try to respond to you personally, but I will not read the comment on the podcast unless you tell me that it is okay to do so. So that's buffystorypod at gmail.com. On the DVD, Joss Whedon pointed out that Buffy arrives when Dawn is the happiest. She and Kevin are connecting and that that is Joss's thing to devastate a character when they are the happiest. At 17 minutes 31 seconds in, Buffy and Dawn are in the hallway near the lockers. Buffy wants to go outside the school, but Dawn demands to know, and Buffy says, it's bad news. Dawn says, where's mom? And Buffy responds, mom had an accident, or um, something went wrong from the tumor. And Dawn says, is she okay? Is she? But she's okay. But it it's serious, but... And at 18 minutes, 16 seconds in, we get that moment where Buffy says, Dawn. And then the camera shifts to inside the room, looking out, watching Buffy tell Dawn, but we don't hear Buffy's words. And we are with the teacher and the other students. As they watch, we see their faces, their reactions, and we see Dawn's, and we hear her, though she's muffled by the glass. She is crying she is so distraught and she crumples to the ground and I found this so much more powerful because we know what Buffy must be saying and instead of hearing it we're focused on Dawn's reaction and also the other people watching this. The camera pans to Dawn's drawing, the chalk drawing, which looks like a woman on her back, somewhat like Joyce's pose on the couch. And I found it so interesting that Joss Whedon said on the DVD that they shot scenes with Buffy telling Dawn. They spent a lot of time on them. And in the end, he realized that he didn't need those moments that we didn't need to see or hear Buffy tell her and instead he wanted to show the environment that it took place in and then cut to that female body Dawn was drawing. The next scene we again see Joyce's body so this is a new act starting and the doctor opens Joyce's blouse and cuts her camisole before the autopsy and this act the previous one was all dawn this one is about the friends at 19 minutes 13 seconds in willow stands at her open closet staring at a green shirt the camera cuts to anya and xander in the car pulling up outside and then pans to tara who's looking out the dorm room window and then we follow her inside as she tells willow they're here willow tosses one one shirt after another onto the bed they all feel wrong to her Xander and Anya sit for a while and wait Xander asks if Anya wants to come up Anya responds you're double parked and Xander says let him give me a ticket at 20 minutes 54 seconds in Willow takes out a purple shirt and asks Tara if it looks too somber but another shirt looks too cheery to her and she keeps saying if only she had that blue one Joyce really liked it and is Tara sure it's not in her room then Willow asks about the purple does it mean anything bad and Tara thinks that purple is associated with royalty and Willow responds well I can't see Buffy in the morgue and be all royal she continues in that vein and says I have to be supportive Buffy needs me to be supportive why do all my shirts have to have stupid things on them why can't I just dress like a grown-up this is some minor conflict here not between Tara and Willow but with Willow and herself not knowing what to do feeling like she ought to know ought to be able to handle this and be more grown up and I love that use of of the clothes and her feeling about her her t-shirts and how that symbolizes for her not feeling grown up enough and Joss Whedon said he drew a lot of this from when he was getting ready to go to a friend's funeral and he went to 10 different stores for the perfect black tie this too is something I empathized with uh, even in in the first watch but resonated so much more with me after I had some life experiences 
a day after my mom was killed, my dad in the hospital had had a surgery, seemed to come out of it well, and then I got a call in the middle of the night that they needed to do some other emergency surgery that they had been hoping to wait longer to do. And I I talked to one of my brothers and told him I would meet him there. I called the other one. And then I went and like did my makeup. I, I put on foundation and mascara and blush and eyeliner. I just clipped my hair back. I didn't care about the hair. But I, I still don't know what what that was about. If it I think it was some attempt to do something that I could control, something that felt normal even though it was two in the morning or three in the morning. And I I drove to the hospital. And I remember one of my sisters-in-law, who is not a model of tact, I walk into the waiting room and she's like, well, you look terrible at three in the morning. It was the craziest moment and also goes to something we will say later about people dealing with death differently. At 21 minutes, 33 seconds in, Tara holds Willow, kisses her forehead, and then kisses her lips. This is the middle of the episode and in the structure that we almost always see here in Buffy and in many films and novels at the midpoint of a story. You see either the protagonist making a major commitment to the quest or suffering a major reversal. So here we do still have that different structure. The act break, which often corresponds with one of those points, came a little earlier. It's interesting, though, that there is something of a commitment by the show here because this is the first on-screen kiss between Tara and Willow, despite that we have known that they have a romantic relationship for quite some time in the show. We had not seen this, and at the time, it was seen as controversial for a TV show to include a kiss between two women or two men and yet I don't remember any pushback on this in the media or from the usual groups that get outraged and I do think it's partly because of the context because how how do you complain about that in this episode I do not think that was necessarily Whedon's intent in putting it there in fact on the DVD what he said is they showed the kiss because it also was part of the physicality of getting through dealing with death this very physical act of comfort from Tara to Willow and he wanted to do the kiss in the middle of an episode rather than having a big kiss on screen episode. So Tara comforts Willow assuring her she can be strong like an Amazon and at 22 minutes nine seconds in Anya and Xander climb the stairs and Anya asks what they will do. Xander's not sure Willow is the one who talked to Giles Inside the room, Willow and Xander hug. Xander asks how Willow's doing. She wraps her arms around herself and shakes her head, and Xander says, I know the feeling. And there is that comfort there in someone who understands you, because Willow has not said anything with her words, but Xander does understand. Now all of them are standing in a sort of square, and they all have their arms crossed over their chests or folded as they talk looking very awkward and Willow says she's afraid she'll start to cry again Anya says Xander cried at the apartment it was weird and Willow responds yeah it's a it's a thing we do this scene Joss Whedon said is all about their helplessness they're the Scooby gang they're supposed to be helping Buffy and they've got nothing and he said much of this came from his own experience losing his mother but also stories from other people he knew and he pointed out every character here reacts differently and deals with it differently willow tells them they'll meet giles at the morgue buffy's going to school to tell dawn which everyone is also very distressed about Willow says she needs to change. Tara tells Xander it wasn't Glory, it was natural. Xander wants to go after Glory because maybe she covered her tracks. And Willow, who has now pulled a different sweater over her head, says, but why? Why would Glory do that? She'd want them to know. Now Xander expresses more anger. He blames the doctors for discharging Joyce and telling her she's fine. He says, we don't have enough monsters in this town that doctors got to help them out. Willow 
now is calmer as she tries to help Xander and she puts up her hands and says, let's go, you and me, knowing he needs someone to fight. And Xander takes a deep breath and kisses her forehead. Ani now asks if they'll see the body and goes on, will they be in the room with a dead body? Willow is appalled and says she doesn't know. Tara suggests that they should take over patrolling for however long. And Willow says she can't wear this sweater. She really wants the blue one. And Tara leaves to go look in the laundry room for it. Now Ani asks if they'll cut the body open and Willow tells her to just stop talking how can she act like that and Anya not being snippy I don't think but just asking says am I supposed to be changing my clothes a lot is that the helpful thing to do and Willow tells her it's not okay for her to be asking these things and now we have this wonderful moment and Joss Whedon commented that it is a twist because no one expects sensitivity from Anya but Anya now gets teary and angry and gives this speech and says but I don't understand I don't understand how this all happens how we go through this I mean I knew her and then she's there's just a body and I don't understand why she just can't get back in it and not be dead anymore it's stupid it's mortal and stupid and and Xander's crying and not talking and and I was having fruit punch and I thought well Joyce will never have any more fruit punch ever and she'll never have eggs or yawn or brush her hair not ever and no one will explain to me why And she cries and puts her hands over her face. And she sits on this this Papazan lounger, this wicker lounger in the corner. And Willow says, we don't know how it works. Why? And Anya shifts uncomfortable. Something is uh, behind her. And she pulls out this blue sweater, not realizing it's what Willow was looking for, and tucks it into a drawer. The speech was moving to me the first time through, but even more so after one of my nieces died when she was 11. Seeing her in her coffin, I had that exact thought. Where did she go? Like, why can't she just be back again? And I I think that everyone has felt that when they have lost somebody, when someone has died, but I don't know that I had the words for it until I watched this episode again. At 28 minutes, 37 seconds in, there's a sudden noise as Xander punches the wall. We don't see it. We only hear it. And then we see the result. And it takes a while for Xander to get his hand out. Anya's upset and then angry. He could have hit something electrical. Willow asks if it made him feel better, and he says for a second. Tara returns as Xander pulls his hand out of the wall. It's bleeding at the knuckles, and they exchange a look, almost a smile. This moment I didn't quite get. I got the punching the wall for sure, but not that look. And on the DVD, Joss Whedon said it was not as clear as he meant it to be. He wrote it to show that everything has changed in that moment because now they all have something physical to latch on to getting Xander's hand out of the wall and then him bleeding that they can be the Scoobies again and deal with this crisis together so that's why Xander feels better when he looks at his hand bleeding and why Tara nods at him Tara tells Willow she couldn't find the blue as Xander washes his hand and Willow says it doesn't matter she wants to be there for Buffy Xander says they'll go and they'll help and Anya says how are we going to help and Willow runs back to get a different shirt at 30 minutes 34 seconds in the camera pans to the view through the window down to the street where Xander's car gets ticketed for double parking and this is another example in the episode of how the real world does not stop and that's another thing I identified with my niece's funeral I had rented a car I live 
in downtown Chicago where you don't need a car. And at the time where I lived, there was almost nowhere to park. You couldn't park overnight, and my building did not have parking. And I put this rental car, I went to the wake, drove home, put the rental car in a lot across the street where you could only park till 4 a.m. And I went out at 6.30 in the morning. This guy was yelling at me who was the parking lot attendant. And it, it was it was just too much. I just thought, no, no, I can't deal with this. Uh, I did not get a ticket because I think that was right about when they were going to come out and start giving the tickets or towing, which would have really been so hard to deal with, with towing of the rental car but I was able to just drive away. Now we are at another act break because we see Joyce. It's 30 minutes 44 seconds in. Hands are taking off latex gloves and cover Joyce's body. So it's after the autopsy. And the doctor who did the surgery is the one who did it, which is is not real life, but it works for the story. I mean the autopsy would most places would not be done that day either and nobody would be literally waiting for it. You would get a report later, but it fits this story and the doctor walks through this dark hall away from where the bodies are past offices he puts on a white coat sounds start filtering in from the rest of the hospital and Joss Whedon said he wanted to show the doctor walking to that other part of the hospital where Buffy and her friends are waiting to make clear that she is there in that same building This episode of the podcast is sponsored by creating compelling characters from the inside out. No matter what type of fiction you write, what draws readers in is the characters. If the reader doesn't care about them, the most gripping plot won't carry the day. But diagrams, checklists, and charts can only take you so far. You need to know your characters and love them or love to hate them just as you do people in real life, which means learning about your characters from the inside. This book helps you explore your characters so that you can learn what drives them to do what they do, understand their hopes, fears, and motivations, and create living, breathing characters rather than cardboard cutouts. Creating Compelling Characters is available in a workbook edition and multiple ebook formats. It includes questions and prompts to help you and draws on specific examples from popular books and classics such as Gone Girl, The Dead Zone by Stephen King, and Pride and Prejudice. Ask for Creating Compelling Characters from the Inside Out by L. M. Lilly at your local library or bookstore, or find links to all my books for writers at writingasasecondcareer.com under Books for Writers, or under the nonfiction menu item at lisalilly.com. We're at 32 minutes, 7 seconds in as the doctor approaches Buffy. Usually here in an episode, I look for the last major plot term, which I think of as the three-quarter turn, and we are about three-quarters through. That turn typically grows out of the midpoint and spins the story in yet another new direction. So we do have a new direction here. It doesn't grow from the midpoint, but it certainly grows out of everything that came before. Because in this act, we will mainly see the friends and Buffy together dealing with the death and the body. They all hug one another. Anya throws herself at Giles, who hugs her. When the doctor approaches, Buffy steps forward away from her friends for a moment, and it looks almost like a standoff between her and the doctor. And then Giles and Dawn join Buffy. The doctor says he examined their mother's body. Dawn wants to see Joyce, and Buffy tells her not now. In the commentary, Joss Whedon said a lot of this act is Dawn dealing with the unreality of it all, and Buffy already went through that when she called Joyce the body. But Dawn 
is feeling disbelief because she hasn't had that physicality yet. She hasn't seen Joyce's body. And so for her, it can't possibly be real, while for Buffy, it is too real. Buffy doesn't understand how different it is for Dawn. The doctor tells Buffy Joyce had what looked like an aneurysm near where the tumor was removed. Buffy asks, shouldn't they have known about it? And the doctor says, sometimes they're not detectable. And Joyce was aware of that possibility. Since she didn't get on the phone, her death must have been very sudden. And even if someone was by her side, it's doubtful it could have been handled in time as he talks when he says by her side the scene quickly cuts to Joyce in the living room saying my head and Buffy running to her side so Buffy is imagining that she was there and could stop this Buffy asks if he's sure Joyce wasn't in pain the doctor says absolutely but as he keeps talking the sound shifts his mouth moves but instead of the words he's saying we hear a voice over by the doctor I have to lie to make you feel better Giles asks the doctor what needs to be done and the doctor talks about forms and decisions to be made and Giles offers to handle as much as he can for Buffy. After he leaves, Willow suggests they all sit, and Dawn says, what about, and Buffy says, what about what? And Dawn responds, nothing, I have to pee. And this too on the DVD, Joss Whedon said this was also a moment of too much physicality. Buffy asks Dawn if she wants someone to go with her, and Dawn says she still remembers how to pee. Dawn leaves. Buffy tells the others she thinks Dawn's mad at her, and she doesn't think Dawn believed her. And here on the DVD, Whedon commented on what I see as another theme, that in his experience, death tears people apart. He learned from TV that it made everyone stronger and better, and they learned about themselves. But in life, his experience was that an important piece is taken out of the puzzle among family and friends, and that piece will never be replaced. The people will never be the same. There's no glorious resolution. Sometimes there are lessons from it because you have to take something out of it because it's inevitable, but there isn't this amazing catharsis or resolution. And he said that's why a lot of people turn to what Tim Minier calls the sky bully. And Joss Whedon said since he doesn't believe in the sky bully, he hasn't found any any real value in death other than I wish it wouldn't. And this too is something so brought home to me with my parents' deaths. I just felt angry all the time. And some of the hardest things for me were when people who do believe in uh, God as a sort of sky bully, I love that term, would tell me this was God's plan and this that it was all for the good because it was part of God's plan. Someone told me this two days after my mother's death while my father was in a coma trying to recover from surgery and I just bit my lip and didn't say anything because I wanted to say terrible, horrible things back. Um, another friend who knew, bo both of these people knew I was not a believer, said, well, I know you don't believe it, but you'll see your parents again and they're looking down on you and that should be comforting. And I literally thought, okay, that's like you told me. Things will be fine because Santa Claus will come and bring your family back again. I also did not say that. I didn't mind the people who didn't know my views, who said things about angels in heaven and and they're in a better place because my parents were religious and their friends and people who were close to them I took it as good wishes but when someone knew that I did not share those beliefs and insisted on telling me them over and over I had one friend who did it over and over it did for me feel like tearing things apart uh, fortunately the people closest to me did not did not do that so there were people I became closer with and as I dealt with grief a lot of that anger went away and in the very long run there may be some things that I did learn from it but as Joss Whedon said it it was because you have to take something from it not because I think death is some sort of blessing in disguise or some sort of great plan uh, by some higher being. 
watching this episode later did help me because it was one of the only stories I ever saw that didn't try to force some type of narrative onto death that just dealt with this is the way it is. Willow now offers to go get food. Xander and Anya go with Willow and Tara and Buffy sit side by side but looking straight ahead, their hands on their knees, some distance apart, and Buffy says she's sorry Tara has to go through all this. And Tara tells her Buffy doesn't need to worry about her. Buffy says everybody wants to help, and I don't even know if I'm here. I don't know what's going on. I've never done this. That's just an amazingly dumb thing to say. Obviously, I've never done this before. And Tara says, I have. My mother died when I was 17. And for the first time, the two look at each other, and Buffy says she didn't know. She's sorry. And Tara assures her she's only telling Buffy because there were things that Tara felt, thoughts and reactions she couldn't explain or try to. She felt like she was losing it or she was some kind of horrible person and she knows it might be different for Buffy, but if Buffy ever needs, she trails off, but they do look at each other a little longer. Back to my statement of I felt angry at everyone, I did sometimes feel like a horrible person person like I must be and on the DVD Joss Whedon said he was surprised how many people wrote him and said they got catharsis from the episode and it surprised him because he really was writing about that feeling in those first few hours when there's no solution or catharsis just to capture the moments and for him it was a lovely revelation that just finding a moment and expressing it showing human behavior with no grand conclusions gave people comfort and Whedon said, it's pretty much why I'm here. And as I already said, that was my experience with it, watching it after having gone through something similar. Buffy asks Tara if it was sudden, meaning Tara's mother, and Tara says no. And yes, it's always sudden. At 38 minutes, 16 seconds in, Dawn exits the restroom. She sees Tara and Buffy, but heads the other way and goes into that hallway that leads to the morgue and the bodies. And Joss Whedon said that this was a very different walk for Dawn than it had been for the doctor. For the doctor, it was routine. And for Dawn, it's a horror. So instead of it being brightly lit, now everything is darkness and it's more like a regular episode of Buffy. Dawn goes into the room with the corpses on the tables. She locks the door behind her. I don't know why but I'm guessing to keep anyone from stopping her since she could understandably feel that's what Buffy and others would do. She goes toward the table where Joyce is draped and reaches out but then she stops closes her hand into a fist and drops it to her side. Behind her, quietly, a vampire sits. He was also under a sheet. He's naked. He sees Dawn, smiles, and moves toward her, and Dawn turns and faces him. When I first saw the episode, I remember feeling like, oh, we're finally getting a regular Buffy episode in the last four minutes and I found it frustrating but on rewatch this worked for me and Joss Whedon said that people asked him why the vampire like this at the end of the episode and he said for one thing it looks more like a corpse which we don't often see with the vampires and also it's a naked man so it's this intrusion that's offensive and completely physical that Dawn is dealing with so life goes on in the face of dealing with death dealing with the body and on Buffy that means horrible things happen and this too struck me so hard after dealing with the deaths in my family because it's true like nothing in life gives you a pass because you're grieving almost nothing if you're really lucky some of the people around you will but for the most part difficult awful other things still happen it isn't like you hit your quota and you get a pass for a little while and this is such a strong representation of that for dawn so at 40 minutes 23 seconds in we're back to willow xander and anya who return with candy bars cups of coffee and sandwiches and their arms are overflowing and willow says we panicked buffy doesn't want anything and they ask about dawn buffy goes to look for her so now we're approaching what would normally be a climax that's the 
almost end of an episode or story where the opposing forces have their final clash and resolve, win, lose, or a partial win and partial loss. Here, this episode also is different from a typical story structure because there isn't, as we'll see, really a resolution. At 41 minutes, 8 seconds in, Buffy goes into that dark corridor. She hears commotion and then Dawn's scream. She sees through the glass of that locked door, the vampire gripping Dawn, trying to bite her. Buffy has to break through the locked door. Again, much like we feel when someone dies and we're grieving that everything we do feels hard. And Whedon commented on the fight between Buffy and the vampire, that it was different than any other on Buffy, that it was as much of a gross wrestling match as he could make it. Her hands are in his face, the sheet comes off Joyce in the worst possible way, and that it was more like a genuine struggle than a cool kickboxing match, which is a great way to describe most of the Buffy fights. Joyce's face and head are now uncovered and at 42 minutes 4 seconds in, Dawn on the floor on her stomach while Buffy fights looks up and sees Joyce's hair over the edge of the gurney. Buffy grabs a small bone saw and finally cuts off the vampire's head and collapses on the floor on her back, breathing hard. After a few seconds, she shifts onto her side and looks toward Dawn and sees Joyce uncovered on the gurney. Dawn now kneels close to the gurney and says, is she cold? And Buffy says, it's not her. It's not her. She's gone. And Dawn says, where'd she go? And Buffy watches in the background as Dawn reaches her hand to touch Joyce's face. She inches toward the face. And at 43 minutes, 39 seconds in, the scene cuts and we go to credits before her hand touches Joyce. This is also one of the longest Buffy episodes. And that's what I mean by no resolution. We don't see Dawn touching the body. Normally, there would also be falling action, that part of the episode that ties up loose ends, resolves subplots, maybe continues season arcs. But here, unless we see Buffy defeating the vampire as the climax and Dawn approaching the body as falling action, there really is no falling action. And I I don't think you can see Buffy's fight with the vampire as the climax unless you see it as she re-engages with ordinary life but it's hard to see it as a win or loss or a resolution for her last comments from Joss Whedon on the commentary he said that death being physically real and physically unreal is expressed in that last shot when John reaches out to touch in a show about physicality but never does touch And he said some people thought that next week Dawn would heal Joyce with her magic key powers because we get that cut there, which I don't remember thinking, but that's really interesting. And he said what it meant to him was that we want to touch death, but there is nothing there. There's no resolution, no ending, no lesson. There's just death. Very much a different type of episode of Buffy and that does seem to confirm that there really is no climax here. It is meant to end this way. Now one thing I have not talked about other than in the beginning is who's the protagonist here and who is the antagonist. I talked about the opposing forces but who are are they? And I think this is an episode where the group is the protagonist. Buffy, Dawn, Buffy's friends, Giles as a group dealing with death as the antagonist or both death and life, the fact of the way life is when someone dies. When I look to see who's a protagonist, I look at three things. What character actively pursues a goal throughout? Whose point of view are we in the most and who has the most at stake? And here, 
all of them need to deal with Joyce's death and Joyce's body, though certainly Buffy has the main responsibility, but they all do need to. When it comes to point of view, we probably get the most of Buffy's because there are scenes from her point of view in every act, even though the second one focuses on Dawn We do get a little from Buffy's perspective, but there is also quite a bit of Dawn in this episode and in the last act, and certainly in the act that is about our friends. It is mainly all four of them and how they're dealing with it. And finally, who has the most at stake? We have to go with both Buffy and Dawn. They have both lost their mother, and need to deal with that physical reality of death, perhaps slightly more at stake for Buffy because she also feels responsible for Dawn and because she is the one who will need to do most of this. But at the same time, it is such a deep loss for Dawn and Dawn feels so isolated. It is always tricky to do a group as a protagonist and probably on first watch that's part of why I didn't love this episode or didn't know what to think of it. If you're going to have a group protagonist it's a good idea to have one character who still serves as the representative or focal point of that group and we don't exactly have that here. We get more of Buffy than anyone else but Still, it's not that she is representing the group. We are seeing each person dealing differently. Death is the antagonist, both death and life, because the only job of the antagonist is to push against the protagonist. And both death and life as it happens, as it keeps going on and requiring you to do things, is pushing against all our characters here. And this is where I started thinking about the metaphor question. Another reason when I watched this the first time I was puzzled by it is Buffy, I think, is strongest when it deals in metaphor. Vampires as metaphor, the hellmouth as a metaphor for life, high school on the hellmouth. And this episode, until I broke it down here for the podcast, I found devoid of metaphor. Even the vampire at the end, as Joss Whedon said, it's not your usual fight Buffy has. It feels different. And I felt like there's no metaphor. You're just giving us life, the the realities of life when someone has died. But now, listening to the commentary and going through it, I think that the body itself is a metaphor for the fact that not only when you lose someone must you grieve that loss, but there are all these physical and practical realities of death that you have to handle and have to deal with. It is life continuing with everything harder and so much more that you have to do as you are grieving that reminds you of it, that immerses you in it. So in that sense, the body is the metaphor for the way that life continues for the necessity of dealing with death. So let me know what you think, if you see that as a metaphor, um, how you felt about the episode to start. And remember, if you don't want to comment somewhere publicly on the internet, you can email me at BuffyStoryPod at gmail.com. That is it other than a short foreshadowing section, which does include spoilers. If you find the way I break down story helpful and want to try it for your own writing, you can download free story structure worksheets. There's a link at writingasasecondcareer.com slash your hyphen novel. If you're not sticking around for foreshadowing, thank you so much for listening. Come back in two weeks for Season 5, Episode 17, Forever, where Buffy and Dawn grieve Joyce's death differently, leading Dawn to attempt a dangerous spell. And we're back for foreshadowing, which includes spoilers. In some ways, 
this entire episode is foreshadowing for the rest of the season, for season six, for season seven, because Joyce's death sets off so much for Buffy and Dawn. For now, I'll focus on just a couple things. That silence when Buffy tells Dawn, everyone watches from inside that art classroom. We see Dawn's reaction, but we don't hear Buffy say it. And then later when Buffy doesn't understand why Dawn keeps wanting to see Joyce and keeps putting her off, this foreshadows this disconnection between the two of them and Dawn's feeling of isolation. She feels in this episode so isolated, so lost. She and Buffy don't understand each other. That will be a key element of the next episode where Dawn tries to bring Joyce back but it also continues in season six when Buffy is there but Dawn feels so lost and so alone and we foreshadow a bit of the conflict to come with Tara and Willow there's no reason now to think it will be a conflict because Tara is so supportive and there for Willow and comforts her but when Tara talks with Buffy and connects with Buffy about Tara's mother's death later in the season Tara will here and there say things about how it is when you lose someone and I, I forgot the name of the episode but the one where Glory takes Tara's brain sucks out Tara's brain right before that Willow and Tara had that fight and part of it the sort of outside thing that sparks it is that Willow says she feels like Tara is being a bit of a know-it-all about having experienced death and being the one who knows everything and then she talks about it in connection with magic and in connection with being gay and it becomes this huge fight so there are these tiny seeds here of that also Tara's comment about feeling like maybe she was a horrible person and having these thoughts and feelings this is part of why the gang will believe that Buffy is having sex with spike when they see him with the buffy bot and it's why they don't question whether it's really buffy despite that there was the robot april so recently also it sets up season six where buffy deep in grief not just over joyce but over her own death and return to life deep in grief and depressed will do many things that the friends don't understand and that she herself does not understand including her relationship with spike so much of that is set up and it makes sense because in a lot of ways in season five Buffy does not get to grieve Joyce she has so much she has to deal with and in the way to the world she goes on overload and becomes catatonic Willow brings her back but immediately Buffy has to face off with glory she finds peace when she sacrifices herself in the gift but when she's back in season six all of that is still there waiting for her and these comments in this episode foreshadow a lot of what Buffy will go through so on that very happy note thank you again for listening and a special thank you to patrons who support the show come back in two weeks for episode 17 of season five forever where Dawn draws on the dark arts to cope with Joyce's death if you want to hear more Buffy and the Art of Story content and would like to support the podcast at the same time, you can do so at patreon.com slash Lisa M. Lily or at buymeacoffee.com slash Lisa M. Lily. You can listen to back episodes of Buffy and the Art of Story at lisalily.com slash Buffy Story or lisalily.com slash YouTube. Comment on the episodes or connect with me on Instagram or Twitter at Lisa M. Lilly or by visiting the Buffy and the Art of Story Facebook page or email 
your comments to buffystorypod at gmail.com. Find book editions of Buffy in the Art of Story at lisalilly.com slash Buffy Books. Music for this episode was written and performed by Robert Newcastle. Buffy in the Art of Story is a production of Spiny Woman LLC, copyright 2022. All rights reserved. Thank you.